Um, and then, you know, being less critical about themselves and, and to others. And one of the, the great things is that I'm seeing when I work in schools is that it really gets kids to slow down. We call this brain deactivation. It's the ability for a student to, on the spot, slow down his brain, not to be reactive, to know how to settle down and to be calm. So this is one of the great benefits and the work that we do sort of emphasizes this because uh, stress um, is, is very troublesome, um, you know, for anyone. And so this helps kids a lot with dealing with stress. Next. Um, as, in terms of um, leadership, uh, as you know, there are a lot of major corporations now that are involved in mindfulness. They have full-blown mindfulness programs uh, in their organizations. Uh, organizations like Google, General Mills, Goldman Sachs, Apple, Genetech, Intel, Procter & Gamble are all involved in the mindfulness uh, movement because their studies have shown um, that uh, perf leaders perform at a, at a better rate, uh, more quality performances by the leaders. And the other thing that they're finding is that they're gaining a greater appreciation uh, for other people. Uh, they're tolerating differences and so on like that. It also, mindfulness uh, clears your brain from all the clatter that we sort of, uh, our minds tend to do. Um, gets you to trust your intuition, gives you more energy, as I mentioned before. I think the self-awareness part is really, really critical. I think it's the number one skill for leadership. So it helps in self-awareness, being aware of what you're all about so you can relate to others. And of course, being non-judgmental. Next. Um, this is an interesting study that I came across. It was done in 2013 in Texas. They identified 149 principals um, who displayed some of these mindful characteristics like compassion and non-judgmental. And um, they um, followed them through in this research study. And then they found out that did this make a difference in student achievement. So they teased out all the variables and found a strong correlation between uh, school leaders that are mindful and student achievement. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And you could look this research up uh, yourself. But this is really important because if it has that connection, I think we all would be really interested in it, as well as the other things that, um, you know, satisfy us with mindfulness. Next. Um, so there are lots of studies about mindfulness. Um, and here are some of the claims that it makes your brain more plastic, neoplasticity, neuroplasticity, which means that uh, we now know that the brain can be altered. Um, anything from what we call cortical remapping uh, in injuries where one part of the brain compensates for another to the very small changes in neurons. We could actually see that now, so we know this is true. The important part is that we, um, through these studies, we know that thought and emotions can change the brain. So the brain isn't hardwired. We could make it plastic, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, there's studies that uh, say that it increases the gray matter, which is important for learning and memory. Um, studies, they're mixed about sleeping, that it's better than sleeping. We know that if you take a nap, um, you know, if you miss your eight hours of sleep, you take a nap, it's going to be helpful. So I'm not sure about those. There are some studies that say that it reduces blood pressure. Um, there are also some that we all should be interested in this next one the telomeres, because that's the anti-aging process. So we know that telomeres are at the end of the chromosomes and it protects the chromosomes. And these telomeres, um, it's shorter and shorter, it, that's the aging process. So mindfulness seems to protect against that. And this part here, relieving pain up to 40%, um, my experience with this in, in the medical wellness center that I'm in, so I'm using mindfulness um, almost 100% for pain reduction, and I'm getting pretty good results. I know that it that this is true for hypnosis and, and other um, modalities, but it seems to be working for mindfulness, at least with the patients that I'm working with. So that's, uh, you know, a very pleasing kind of result, um, and uh, I'm finding that to be more and more 
uh, beneficial in other areas also. Next. Tony, before you go to the next slide, uh, speaking of pain, um, I, I forgot to say something uh, to the audience, and I think your emails uh, might be open, and that's causing the, the sound issue. So if you would shut your emails off while I'm saying this, it would be helpful. Um, and that's to the audience. I neglected to invite you to ask questions as Tony goes on. Uh, and some of you I know found the t question box right away because you responded to my beeping question. But please, please uh, send questions that will be helpful to you and to others because Tony will answer those at the end of the process. Okay, Tony, you ready for the next slide now? Uh -huh. Okay, there you are. So the, the, in schools, the, the four goals that I always talk about when I go into schools is, um, it's very simple. There are four goals. Well, one, we want to shrink the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain, um, you know, where the brain reacts in, uh, in a negative way and uh, to control that. Uh, it increases the hippocampus, which is responsible for learning and memory, and um, activates the prefrontal cortex. That's, this is school stuff, planning, impulsivity problem solving. We often combine the mindfulness programs um, with executive function. So we're getting, you know, great results with that. And the other thing, as I mentioned before, it deactivates the brain. It reduces stress. Um, and let me talk a little bit about stress. So the next slide, if you would show that. Um, what you see in front of you is on the left hand side is a healthy brain. The one on the right is a, a brain that has been exposed to constant stress. Uh, <clears throat> and you will see in the, the temporal lobes, there's, there's a, no activity. The black spots, they're not holes. They're, it, it means that there's no activity going on. Well, that area right there is regulating emotion. Um, and it also, it, it, it uh, dulls the senses. So in, in fact, reality, the, the, a child's reality isn't, isn't real um, or distorted, I should say, not that it's not real. So you could see the differences in a brain, uh, literally shrinks the brain. Um, and when a brain is, you know, has that much of a problem, it doesn't learn, it doesn't, can't remember names, it can't remember facts. Um, so very little learning is going on in that brain. The next slide. This shows you that uh, how, um, Persistent stress changes the architecture of the brain. The top is a normal, um, the normal dendrites, the, um, and you see uh, many more. And below that, under stress, literally it's shrinking it. Um, so this, is, this causes problems, uh, as I said before, with uh, memory and learning and everything else. So I think this is a pretty interesting um, uh, picture of what goes on when when we stress ourselves out, which is not healthy. The next slide. Um, Daniel Siegel, who is a medical doctor um, in a recent issue of Psychotherapy Networker, said this about mindfulness and what your brain does on mindfulness. It promotes the integrative function of the various regions of the brain, including the prefrontal cortex giving the person a sensation of inner awareness and enhanced powers of self-regulation. And you'll see what I have at the bottom, that almost all mental health problems have to deal with um, self-regulation. I mean, things like um, uh, obesity and depression. So uh, mindfulness helps in this area. I mean, we, we have, you know, research technology research that shows this. And in schools, I know we have lots of problems going on, and um, we have no idea what you know kids bring to school. So we're finding that mindfulness helps in many, many different areas. Next slide. You can see here uh, a, a brain the, on the left hand side, uh, where there's uh, which is the baseline. And after meditating, you see the integrative function right there. So uh, there's mo more metabolic metabolic uh, activity in that brain after mindfulness. So we know now that there's something going on. The brain is in hardwire. We could change it just by thinking about it. Um, so this is um, an important concept uh, for educators to know that, you know, we're not sort of set in our ways and that we could change easily simply by thinking about it or dealing with our emotions correctly. 
Next slide, John. So I mentioned before that um, I came across some startling statistics uh, a couple of years ago, which sort of turned me around, and I said, I've got to do something about this, you know, and I've got to get this information out to educators. Um, here are some of these trends now from 2010 to the present. Um, we're finding a, a tremendous increase in affective disorders uh, all the way down into pre-K. Now, when I was doing therapy a number of years ago, I never really remember seeing any elementary students for some of these affective disorders like depression and bipolar. Um, but obviously, um, more and more and more of these disorders are being reported, and uh, the research bears this out, which to me is kind of amazing that it's all the way down in the elementary schools and in the middle schools. Um, according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2015, 50% more teens are diagnosed as depressed versus just four years ago from that date. Um, suicide rate for teenage girls 12 to 14 has tripled. For girls 15 to 19, it's uh, about 50% more. Um, and in the American Freshman Survey, um, it's done out of UCLA, uh, they, in the latest survey in 2016, they found that incoming students, freshman students, feel overwhelmed and depressed, and uh, there's quite a few of them, because this is a, is a big survey. And of course, uh, I don't have to mention what's going on just recently with the exposure to violence, but we're also seeing a lot of self-violence, students cutting themselves more, um, in, inflicting harm on themselves. So that's increased all. And of course, over-medicated youth, which I want to, next slide, I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, in ni in, in, the, in um, 1990, there were 500,000 kids on Ritalin in this country. In the year 2000, I think the, the number was about 5 million. So you could see that uptick in medication. Um, right now, last year, uh, 7, prescript 7 million prescriptions were written for Ritalin alone. Um, one in eight of our students take psychotropic medicine. That's like Valium and, and drugs like that. Um, here's a statistic that you should know about. The United States makes up 4.6 of the world's population and consumes more than 80% of the opioids. Um, and we know that we're having a problem throughout the country uh, with opioids. It's becoming more and more of a problem. I know we're trying to address it, but it doesn't, nothing is happening yet. 11% um, of, 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 uh, uh, of Americans over 12 years take antidepressants. Um, in May of 2017, uh, the uh, National Council of Health Statistics gave a survey and uh, found out that 10% of, of students took an illicit drug in the past month, which was April of that year. Um, and 21 million people over 12 years have substance abuse problems. So, uh, this was reported in Drug Use in America by Sarah Miller. So you see that this is becoming a problem uh, in this country and um, more than one thing. So this is the kind of thing that I was reading, kind of kinds of things I was reading and I was getting really upset about. Next slide. Um, here's some bothersome statistics for kids in inner cities. 90% um, of, uh, of students or school age kids have seen a crime either as a, or have witnessed a crime or have been a victim of a crime. Four out of five are abused. 66 percent have one or more psychological disorders, one in 10 attempt suicide, and 27 percent have PTSD. Now, I, I'm saying, um, I've, did, I've done a lot of work in the juvenile justice system, and I'm saying that this is not post-traumatic stress. These kids um, are stressed, you know, right now. They're grieving, uh, and the stress is not, you know, uh, something that happened before, but at the present moment. So uh, this should be a concern for anybody that works in our, our inner cities. Next slide. Um, in terms of technology, um, the Youth Risk sur uh, Surveillance System uh, by the Center of Disease 
uh, shows that the average youth spends about six to eight hours a day on their smartphones and computers. We don't. We do know that the social media, the computers, and IFA, and their smartphones change changes the brains. I think the attention of our students has decreased. It used to be about maybe for an adult 12 to 15 minutes. It's down to about seven minutes now. Um, so I know that teachers tell me all the time that the kids have difficulty paying attention. So um, why am I? you know, giving you all these statistics because I think the answer is in mindfulness. At least we're seeing some of those results. Next slide. Um, here's some other uh, causes of anxiety for our kids today. Um, there are pseudo connections and relationships. Kids are getting these relationships and manufacturing their identities um, uh, over social media and I'm worried about that a little bit. Uh, I'm not against technology. I'm not against computers or anything like that. I think they're fine. But uh, I get a little uh, worried when um, kids are manufacturing identities or getting their identities from someone else on a screen, and there's uh, less and less interpersonal connections. So that some people think that's a problem. Um, parental hierarchy, you know, years ago there used to be a father and a mother, there was a hierarchy. And right or wrong, they passed their values on to kids, but there was some kind of a structure there. And of course now we have fragmented families, uh, single, single parent families, which is okay. Um, but these are some of the reasons that people are giving for the causes of our, our uh, youth anxiety. Um, what can we do about it in the school? I think um, one of the things that I notice is the ineffective interventions and diagnosis in terms of interventions in the school. I want to show you a model that we use. Uh, next slide, John, that I think addresses that because, no, the one back, go back one, that's it. Um, what you're seeing in front of you is, is um, a model that we talk about because I think the only thing that we could do is what we do in school. We can't go home with the kids. We have no control over what they watch on TV um, or what they, you know, what they do on social media. So we have to make sure that what we do in our schools is, is uh, at least making an impact. Uh, the model that you see here uh, is, is, let's say it's a human being. Um, a human being functions in an environment. It's where you are now. It's the behaviors that you can actually see capabilities are, you know, the things you may have writing skills, you might be a good athlete, so on. And we all have beliefs and values. Beliefs are uh, what we think our, our reality our reality is. And values um, are what's important to us. And the beliefs and values sort of form your identity. The interventions that we make in school usually are at the environmental or the behavioral levels. That's not going to change behavior. Einstein said in order to um, you know, uh, solve a problem, you gotta go to a different level. You can't go to you know, the level that the, the thinking is being, creating the thinking. So um, in this model here, it says that you don't make the change at the behavior and environmental level. That's usually behavior modification which works in some cases, but that doesn't change behavior, it stops behavior for time being. Where you really need to make the change is at the belief and value levels. Um, once you change the belief and value levels, uh, the behavior changes automatically. And I think that when we talk about mindfulness, um, that's the level that we're working uh, at, at the beliefs and values levels, which will affect your identity. Next um, slide. So what you see in front of you is a slide that, say you're dealing with a student that has uh, oppositional defiant disorder. So we do things like modify the schedule. We do things like give them choice and flexible assignments. These are some of the common things that we do in school. Um, we don't do things like mindfulness in, in, in most cases. But you can modify your schedule all you want. You can give the kids choice. You can give them flexible assignments. 
But that's not going to happen unless you deal with other issues at the belief and values level. And that's how you get through uh, to the kids through mindfulness, through that, you know, by attacking that area. Um, the next slide. The same is true here with kids who are withdrawn. Uh, what we usually do is give them a mentor, which is great. We uh, reframe their, their language because they're very negative. So we want to change it to a positive kind of thing. Um, we offer lessons, uh, make sure we do the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic uh, modalities, which is good. And we give them um, information in small chunks. Those are the kinds of things that are really, really good for these kinds of kids. But if you don't quiet their inner voice, which is usually negative, uh, none of those things that we try to do to help them will help. Again, that's related to mindfulness. The next slide. Same thing with anxious students. Um, we can create a safe space. We can give them one time tests. We can use uh, concise language right to the bottom line with them and make sure that we have great rapport. But unless we give them a break, unless they learn how to relax and deal with their stress, the other stuff is not going to work. At least that's been my experience in working with teachers in the schools. So um, what you see in front of you, or the last couple of slides, is shows the importance of getting kids to deactivate their brains, to have them go inward, uh, to understand their emotions, to know what they're all about so they could exhibit self-control. Next slide. Um, so what I'm going to try to do now is to show you what we actually do in the schools. This first intervention is, um, this is really great for school leaders because you're under a lot of stress. Uh, this takes exactly one minute to do. So if you could, and I said before, it might be a little awkward for you. I don't know where you are right now. But I'm going to walk you through this, and if you could possibly do this, um, while I'm talking to you, that would be great so you could experience what I'm talking about. So this is, uh, we usually start with something very simple when we introduce mindfulness and something that deals with stress. And we call this the rag doll intervention. So if you're sitting down in a chair right now, what I'm going to ask you to do is to, um, in a moment, is to slowly bend forward as far as you can go without feeling uncomfortable. So you're going to flop down right, you know, have your arms dangle in front of you, and you're going to flop down as far as you can go, and you're going to stay there while I count to 60, and I'll count silently. Then after I count to 60, I'm going to ask you to slowly come up um, into the sitting position again and take a couple of deep breaths. That's all there is to this. This is a one-minute intervention that slows the body down, slows the mind down, it's not going to solve any problems, it's not, it's not going to make you um, understand your identity or anything like that, but it's a proven method to slow the body down and it saves your body. So if you could get to do this in your classroom, if you're a, a teacher, or if, uh, if, if, you're a, you know, if, you, if you're under stress yourself as a school leader, find a place to go for one minute uh, and do this exercise, it's extremely helpful. So what I'm going to ask you to do now, and I know this is kind of strange because I can't see you, you can't see me, but to slowly, if you're sitting down, is to go forward, bend down, and let your arms dangle in front of you. Okay? So stay in that position, and I'm going to count very slowly from 1 to 60. So you won't hear me talking for a little bit. Now I'm going to ask you to slowly, slowly come back up to a sitting position and take a big deep breath in. And as you breathe in, hold it for a couple of seconds 
and then exhale slowly. Now that's that's the what we call the ragdoll intervention. This exercise, and by the way, I didn't even count to 60, but it, it when we do this um, with teachers and administrators, it's uh, it's kind of funny to watch because people have a difficult time just relaxing for one minute. So you'll see lots of people as they're bent over with their arms dangling in front of them, um, moving around and squiggling and, and doing all kinds of things. And I know that if you do this, uh, some of you are probably saying, geez, didn't he get to 60 yet? You know, I've gotten there like 10 minutes ago. So uh, for those people who find it difficult just to relax for a minute, you need this exercise, uh, something to consider. Uh, the, the reason um, individuals like this is because it only takes a minute. But this is what we call, we call these brain breaks in the classroom. So it's a short little intervention that calms people down. The next slide. So what I'd like to do is to try to introduce you to a mindfulness uh, practice right now. If you could follow along again. What I'm going to ask you to do is to take a deep breath in, inhale slowly, hold it for a couple of seconds, then exhale. So you're breathing in and you're holding your breath and then you're exhaling. And as you're sitting there or wherever you are, um, I want you to look around in your environment and I want you to notice what you haven't noticed before. Perhaps you've been in this place where you are right now for you know, a number of years or weeks, I have no idea. But sort of look around and appreciate what's there. I mean, see, see significance, see beauty, see something that you haven't seen before. So you start to look around and, you know, even artificial lights are beautiful if you really take that frame of mind. So you look around and notice the things that you haven't noticed before. And start to appreciate where you are. Start to appreciate the safety of where you are and how fortunate you are to be in a safe place or to be in an environment where there are children laughing. Be thankful and appreciate the health that you're in and that your family is. So you start to go outside of yourself and look around and with a new perspective, really appreciating what's there. And now what I want you to do is to close your eyes and we're going to go inside now. And if you're sitting there with your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to do something and I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say a very unusual question in a moment. But I just want you to focus inwardly right now. So you're sitting there quietly with your eyes closed. Now, I want you to sort of silently answer this question. How do you know where your hands are with your eyes closed? I know that's an unusual question. But you're sitting there with your eyes closed. How do you know where your hands are with your eyes closed without moving them? Now, do you feel a tingling sensation? Do you feel heaviness? Do you feel a lightness? But you know exactly where your hands are, something that your brain can do. But how do you know it? So that's the unusual question that I'm asking you. So just stay for a moment and focus on your hands. That's what we call an anchor. So you're focusing someplace. You're going inside and you're focusing someplace. Now I want you to focus on your breathing. Just breathe normally. And I want you to be aware of different breaths. No two breaths are alike. They're like fingerprints. 
Every breath that you take is different. See if you could see the difference between the breaths that you take. See if you notice there's a little sort of a stoppage or a, a pause between the inhale and the exhale. Maybe you notice the air through your nostrils. So you're being aware of the different breaths that you take. Now, if you can, just go a little bit deeper, someplace inside. I don't know where that is. Some people call it the middle of nowhere. Some people are unable to go there, but that's okay. I want you to go back to your breathing again. Back to that anchor. Listen to your breathing. And your mind might be wandering, and that's okay. But always go back to your breathing, or go back to the focus on your hands. And now, just in one sentence or two, just say what you're grateful for today, and then slowly open your eyes. Now, whether or not you've done that exercise, as long as you were following along with it, you could see sort of the structure that I'm giving you. It's appreciating what's around you. You go inside. Now, for mindfulness practice, that's all you really have to do is start to look around, say, I really appreciate what's, you know, what's my life is all about. Then you go inward, take a couple of deep breaths, and you focus on your breathing or you focus on your hands, and you keep coming back to that because your mind's going to be wandering. You know, that's the way the brain works. It's okay. You might be someplace in Hawaii, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, I, I need to be doing this. That's okay as long as you come back to your anchor and you focus. As long as you do that much, you're okay. As you get better and better into this type of meditation or mindfulness practice, you learn how to go deeper, okay? And that's when you start to really reap the benefits. But if you only get to the part where you're focusing on your breathing, that's all you need to do. I wanted to give you that very simple structure because a lot of people have misconceptions about what mindfulness is all about. They think it's very difficult or they say, I can't do this because you know my mind's going all over the place. That's all right. I'll talk more about the structure in a minute. The next slide. When we meditate or when we do mindfulness um, practices, um, the word med meditation means to become, or mindfulness means to become familiar with or know thyself. All right. So knowledge is power. Self knowledge, knowing about yourself, is self empowerment. That's why I think this is so powerful. So, what does this all mean? The next slide. Um, when we talk about knowing yourself and what meditation is all about, this is the, the structure that we just went through. Um, every time you return to your anchor, whether it's the breathing or the, their hands or something that you're focusing on, um, you build concentration. That's how students build. That's how you teach them to build concentration. Every time you focus on an anchor, you detach from your thoughts. So all you're thinking about is your breathing. So you're getting away from all the clutter and uh, all of the, the mind wandering. So you keep coming back. And the moment that you notice your mind wandering, that's what we call mindfulness. That's the moment of mindfulness. It's not a moment of failure. Very people are, people say, I, I can't do this because my mind's one. That's fine. As long as you come back to your anchor, you're doing it correctly. A lot of times people say to me, I was doing my mindfulness practice, but I keep falling asleep. What I say to that is that when they get tired and they start to fall asleep, this is the first time that individuals are calm. What they're really experiencing is calmness for the first time, so they fall asleep. 
that's okay also, all right? So when you don't criticize yourself for mind wandering, all right, you're practicing self-compassion. And it just sort of builds up for future challenging moments. And that when we talk to students about this, that's that's what we're, you know, we emphasize this part here. You don't have to beat yourself up. Okay? And then the nice part about this is when you notice where your mind wanders, if it does wander, this is an opportunity for you to start to examine your habits and your patterns. And this, of course, is called wisdom or self-understanding. Mindfulness does this. It helps kids to understand these different emotions. They sort things out. They understand what they're all about. They start to appreciate um, what they're all about. And then, of course, they have compassion for themselves and, and then compassion for others. So they just go hand in hand. And these are the things, you know, these are the things that are really um, make up uh, uh, what we call, you know, a unique individual because we all are unique. We all have this inner wisdom. We're all, we're all built the same way, but we have this inner wisdom inside and we have to tap into that. Next uh, slide. Um, this is um, another example. Now, we can't really do this, but I want to explain this because um, – Administrators and teachers always say to me, how do I, you know, what do you do to teach uh, focus? This is a, a really great exercise that we use to teach students how to focus. And then I'll show you how we use it, how some schools are using it um, as instead of detention or some, you know, some, some formal disciplinary action. <clears throat> what you do is you have all of the students standing or your faculty if you're teaching this to your faculty you have them standing up and you roll up a piece of paper into a ball okay and they will stand you know with their hands about 12 inches apart and they will start throwing the paper ball from hand to hand from left to right from left to right back and forth from right to left so as if they're juggling and they do that for about five minutes if you want to do this now you can do this now you want to get a piece of paper and roll it up so you're juggling a, one piece of paper. We recommend paper instead of balls in the classroom because you might get some kids throwing balls all over the classroom and you don't want that. So you're juggling back and forth, right? You do that for about five minutes. And the next thing is you have your participants do the juggling uh, with the paper ball with their eyes closed. Okay, so you're increasing the difficulty. All right, so you do it for five minutes with your eyes open, see how you do. Now, the part that you need to emphasize in this, that dropping the ball, the paper ball, is part of the process. Just because you can't do that and you drop it once in a while, some people drop it frequently, that's okay. That's part of this mind juggling game. So what you do is you teach them how to do that with their eyes open, then they close their eyes, you see how well they do it. And you do this for about five minutes. 10 minutes might be a little bit too long, but you do this for about five minutes. Then the question to the audience is, what were you focused on the entire time? What were you thinking about? And 100% of the time, everyone says, all I was thinking about was juggling the ball. That's what focus is. That's what concentrated attention is. So it's an easy thing to teach. It just depends on you know how you go about teaching it. So this is an intervention um, uh, that's used uh, in another way. After teachers teach this to the students, the struggling, they have them sit there with their eyes closed, with their hands in front of them on the desk, and they imagine that there's a paper ball going back and forth. So in their mind, they're doing the juggling. They're seeing the ball going from left to right, right to left in their mind. This calms the brain down almost immediately. So, you know, if you want to give a student a timeout, you could send them to the timeout place, wherever that is in your room, tell them to do some mind juggling. Kids love this, but it does calm the brain down immediately, but at the same time, it's teaching focusing skills. So I, I think this is one of the unique, what we, what we try to do is to teach these brain breaks, these interventions that are directly related to the structure of mindfulness. So I'm just giving you a couple of examples with the rag doll and, um, and the mind juggling.
Next slide. Um, this is an exercise <clears throat> where this is a stress reduction exercise, and you could do this for a brain break in the classroom. Pushing to the ground is simply having students standing up, and they're going to be rocking back and forth from heel to toe, and they're going to be swinging their arms, palms up, palms down. So they'll be rocking back and forth very slightly on their heels to their toes, and then they increase the intensity. So they push up further and push down, push up, push down, and they tell them, just release all the stress. You do this for about 30 seconds to one minute. So during the classroom, they can get up and uh, relieve their stress that way. The flinging arms is another exercise uh, where students stand up and they just rotate their, they slightly rotate their torso from left to right as they're flinging their arms to the left to the right. And they do that. This is for concentration and stress. I may not be describing this uh, adequately because I can't show you, um, but I hope you get the idea. The, this whole thing is that a combination of relieving stress teaching kids how to deactivate their brains, giving them um, breaks during the day, during instruction, which there should be many short breaks. Uh, it in increases productivity uh, in the classroom. And th the whole idea, if you can structure a mindfulness practice, um, maybe 10 minutes during the day, that's great. We'll talk more about how to do this in schools and what some schools are doing uh, with this movement uh, in a little while. Next slide. Here I'm going to show you um, how we combine some um, interventions with the whole idea of mindfulness practice. So if you had a student, for example, that was overwhelmed um, and really upset, what we would do with that student uh, is to sort of have them draw a stick figure um, with bubbles and they fill in the bubbles as you see in front of you with the problems that they're experiencing that's overwhelming them. So they may be to be five bubbles there may be ten. So you have the student label each one. This represents my anger. This represents I'm upset with my parents or whatever it is. So what they do is they fill in the bubbles and then you ask them which one they want to solve first or work on first. Usually it's the most important one to them and sometimes when you solve that problem all the other ones go away. It doesn't always happen but in, in, in a lot of cases it does. So you ask them which one will make the biggest change in you, which one do you want to work on first. The next slide. Then we ask them um, to pretend and this is a miracle question that's used a lot in therapy. I find it to be very useful in schools. Um, he would say to them, what would happen if you woke up and a miracle occurred and that problem was solved? And you ask him to think about that and you say to them, uh, what would be the first thing that happened? And what would happen after that? What would happen after that? And then you would take them through this whole scenario of the solved problem and you would guide them through this practice. Now this is something that an administrator, uh, if you have time, you can do this. If you're you know, that uh, would be done by a counselor or a teacher that has time. Um, so it's a little longer than the one minute breaks, but I want to show you the sequence. And then the last thing we do with this is the next slide is, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, go back to that, John, I'm sorry. So the next thing that we do with this is we have them after they go through the solution and they can visualize themselves with the problem solved. We ask them to um, relax for about five minutes and to visualize and to future pace the problem. Future pace meaning to project into the future um, with the problem already solved. So they become the director of their own movie in their mind. So I just wanted to take you through that sequence because we combine some of these things that we do, some of the interventions with the mindfulness practice. So after they go through this miracle question and they answer those questions, they would sit down, relax, and just think about it. So um, there are lots of things that you could do um, and a lot of combinations. And, you know, the schools, the, you know, the more creative you are, 
uh, the better it is. There are all kinds of teachers are great with this stuff, and they come up with some terrific interventions. The whole point is that this is a different way of looking at dealing with behavior. It's a, it's a different way of dealing uh, with students that are struggling in school. Um, I'm finding that this is one of the, and I've you know written uh, books about discipline and so on, and uh, I was a proponent of some of the positive behavior kinds of stuff that we all know about. I haven't seen anything that makes a difference like mindfulness practices. If it were up to me, I would do away with detention, I would do away with in-school suspension, I would, you know, train teachers and students in mindfulness. Um, we have a, uh, two schools that we're working with right now in New Jersey, in Bridgewater, Raritan, New Jersey, um, and they're setting up their whole school in terms of uh, mindfulness practices. So you really don't need, I don't think you need, um, I think some of the disciplinary practices that we're doing right now are dinosaurs. I don't, I think they're counterproductive. But I have not seen changes in students like I have um, since I've been doing this mindful. And I'm very uh, optimistic about the future of this. The next slide. So if you want to create your mindful school, how do you do this? Well, um, <clears throat> there are many ways. There's no right way of doing this. It's really, and I can't tell you exactly how to do it for your school because you know your school better than I know your school. Uh, you know your staff better than I know your staff. But I do know there's a couple of things that you, you know, that have to be in place before you do this. In terms of training your staff, my suggestion is that you don't start right away with bringing in someone um, that knows mindfulness and, uh, you know, from the outside to train. That's good. I mean, you know, that's what I do and I'm, you know, maybe putting myself out of work. I, it, the only way that you could really understand this is get a group of teachers together. This is the best way. Get them together, have them sit down um, and maybe, maybe um, guide, you know, as a group, guide themselves through a meditation, experience it. Um, can't read about it, um, can't study this in, you know, in a book. So you've got to have some, and you'd be surprised that there might be a number of people on your staff that have practiced yoga or meditation. You bring them in if they're interested and have them, uh, experience is really important for this. You need to under, they have to go through this mindfulness practice and meditation to really understand it if you're going to do this. So that's, the, the training really is experiential. That's really, really important. Um, some schools are training their students um, in mindfulness. And so these students are really skilled at what they're doing and they go into the classroom, let's say before a big test, and they go through relaxation exercises with the students. Um, that's a great way of doing it. We worked in, a, in, in Louisville, Kentucky. I think the entire elementary system uh, has mindfulness practice in the entire elementary system. Um, we worked in a school in Louisville, Kentucky, the height, one of the high schools, the Fairdale High School. I know they've implemented executive function, which we did there, and now they're on their way uh, to implementing mindfulness practices. And I know that they're training their students to be uh, mindfulness ambassadors. So th these are students that are trained that can talk to other students and they have different functions. Um, I think that we should replace detention with mindfulness centers. Um, school suspension I don't think is necessary in some cases. I know that you have to do that, of, of course. But um, what, what you do when the student comes back after being suspended is really critical. What they do in the detention hall is really critical. And I think if we do something with mindfulness, it'll make a difference. If you um, have a mindfulness center, uh, it would look something like this. You would have someone trained in mindfulness. You would have a um, learning specialist. You would have three or four student tutors trained in mindfulness and um, students that misbehave that need to be pulled out of the classroom. They would go to this place. Of course, this costs money. Um, they would go to this classroom with all these people in there and they would practice mindfulness. Students would be trained in mindfulness to teach them. Uh, the mindfulness teacher would be there to do the interventions. 
and of course they would get their work from the learning specialist. So that's a different kind of um, um, in-school detention or in-school suspension. And I, and I have experience with this kind of a center. It's very, very effective. Tony, um, I'm going to interrupt, interrupt you because we have only about two minutes left. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, there are only two, two, one or two more things I want to say. So you could do all of those things. Um, you could have structured lessons. Some schools are just doing structured lessons in the classroom. Let's say in an eight-week course, um, each day they do something in mindfulness, and that's been very effective. Um, well, I can, in the next slide, John, I just wanted to see what was there. Yeah, that's just a couple of things I was going to talk about. I'm basically done. Um, but there's no right way of doing this. Um, I think if you do your research, um, you get a group of interested people to start with before the training starts, uh, start to experience this first, and then go uh, full-fledged, you know, full, full, full force into this whole movement. Here are some resources for you um, that I found um, to be very helpful. Mindfulschools.org or uh, G-O-A-M-R-A.org. Uh, there's a book called um, Words That Can Change Your Brain. It has some really good things in it. Um, and all, just about all your major universities are doing something in mindfulness. So the research is out there. You could look for yourself. Um, so that's it. If there are any questions, John, I'll be happy to answer you. And last thing, remember to breathe. Uh, whatever you do today, let it be enough. Live in the moment and go easy on yourself. So thank you for listening. Tony, th thanks. thank you very much. This, this question came in from the audience. Any ideas about how we can use mindfulness to motivate students to take the as merit, Arizona merit exams more seriously? Whoa, that's a, uh, well, um, I, all I could say is that, um, you know, when, when uh, the students go in, like some of these student ambassadors, they go in to um, relax students, they talk about some of that, you know, talk about, you know, test anxiety that you, you know, that you could do well. I mean, I guess you can use these student ambassadors to talk about um, why it's, this is important. Um, a lot of times these students that are selected as ambassadors are um, very respected students. And I think if you combine that with the mindfulness practice, the relaxation, and they talk about that, that might be one way to motivate students. Um, I know that in some really tough school districts that I know about, that I've worked in, um, that um, when you have kids coming in and they talk about uh, that this is important, this is important for their life, this is important for who they are, and they tie it to identity, I think that makes a difference. So that might be one way uh, using student ambassadors to combine the two. Thank you. I'd like to once again thank uh, Dr. Scanella for today's presentation. I'd like to invite the audience members to Chicago next the 11th to the 13th, the 2018 Nationals, Princi National Principals Conference will be held in Chicago and we would love to see you there. Thank you again for tuning in today.